going to talk to you about a, a recent problem in Port St. John's shark attack. Does everyone know where Port St. John's is? It's on the wild coast, formerly known as the Trans Sky, about 75 kilometers as the crow flies south of Port Edward, which is the KZN Eastern Cape border. And it's, it's undoubtedly the largest holiday resort on the wild coast. It's significant for the fact that the Amzimbubu River, just over here, there's the, the town itself. The Amzimbubu River, which has the fourth highest river discharge of all South African rivers, flows into the sea at Port St. John's. The um, main bathing beach is Second Beach here. When I went to Port St. John's, I kept looking for First Beach. The first beach was over here, okay, directly in front of the old Hermes Hotel where those of you who are old enough to remember the days of Capital Radio broadcasting on medium wave in the uh, 60s and 70s used to broadcast from, but unfortunately as a result of heavy erosion, basically first beach has literally disappeared and then third beach is down here. And the distance from the river mouth to Second Beach is just under four kilometers as the crow flies. Just some shots of Second Beach. It's certainly very beautiful. The coastline on either side of it is rugged mountains dropping straight down um, into the sea. And it's one of the few swimming opportunities for um, locals. What is also significant about Second Beach is it's in fact the closest beach to Mtata. Tata being the largest uh, city in, um, in, in the northern part of the Eastern Cape. It's about just over an hour's drive. So people living in Tata who want to take the day off and go down to the beach, Second Beach is their, is their closest beach. Some shots of the Amzimbubu River, it's certainly a very, very beautiful um, river. This, if you're coming from KZN, this is the road bridge into the town. People coming from Amtata come down the road on the south bank and then the, uh, the town is actually down the, down the corner. And this is where First Beach used to be, this area here, but uh, the authorities have had to put large rocks in there to prevent uh, increased erosion um, by, the, uh, by the river. And there's a lighthouse on, just on the just around the corner there, um, out, of, out of sight. Unfortunately, the town itself is not particularly great. Um, just to be polite is, is a real eyesore. Um, and unfortunately, to get to Second Beach, you actually have to go through this. And their, uh, their sewage system, as you can see, uh, disposed of rubbish. My first involvement with any sort of shock incident was when the head of the lifeguards at Port St. John's brought this fin to us in 2007. He had one of his staff went swimming um, and disappeared. The fact that he was a lifeguard meant that he didn't drown. Um, his colleagues say they saw commotion and a bit of blood and all they found was the fin. It was quite obvious from the fin that a shark had bitten it, a shark with serrated teeth, um, which we would have expected anyway because the sharks that are responsible for fatal shark attacks are either the bull shark, or Zambezi, the great white, or the tiger and they have uh, prominent serrations on their teeth. But then there was a spate of, of incidents um, there were three in 2009, and there have been nine attacks in the last um, eight years, of which seven of them have been in the last three and a half years. If one looks at the pattern of those attacks, they've all been in the summer months, between December and March. All but two of them have been fatal. Now, if you look at shark attack stats around the South African coast, in general, there are about six attacks a year, of which one is fatal. So you're looking at one in every six attacks generally is, is a fatal one. But in the case of Port St. John's, um, those statistics are very, very skewed. 
the, the most recent attack, the, the victim survived, but I think the only reason he survived was he was in such shallow water, literally waist deep water, that once he'd fought the shark off, and he had huge uh, cuts to both his, his forearms, he was literally able to, to scramble ashore into safety. If he'd been a lot further out, I'm sure that the shark would have, um, would have attacked him again and would likely have succumbed to the injuries. All the attacks have been in the afternoon. That is not a particularly unusual statistic on the East Coast. A lot of, almost all the attacks that I mentioned earlier on the KZN coast in the, in the 50s uh, took place um, in the afternoon. It seems though that it correlates with shark activity, animals moving closer inshore, becoming more active as it gets dark rather than human uh, swimming behavior. What was also significant, even given the proximity of the Umzumbuba River to Second Beach, was the fact that the water wasn't absolutely chocolate brown on, on most of those attacks. <coughs> the scullard, yes. Um, the last incident, incident, we interviewed the victim, and he said that he could see his feet. He was standing in waist deep water, and he could see his feet. So the water wasn't, wasn't that murky. Different distances offshore. Some of the victims were themselves lifeguards or surfers who were at backline or beyond backline. But the most, most recent, and in fact, two of the three most recent attacks, the, the victim was literally standing in, in waist deep water. And then various activities in terms of swimming and uh, surfing and all that. So we were contracted, Sharksport was contracted by then MCM to undertake a shark survey of the area to try and get an understanding of why um, there was a sudden uh, spate of attacks. We did our first survey in 2011. Paul designed this, uh, sorry, this cradle to bring the sharks alongside with a view of tagging them, searching an acoustic tag, but we found that Sharks were boats weren't designed to have these sort of cradle structures on the side, so we soon abandoned those. And we spent two weeks at Port St. John's in November of 2011. The first two sharks we caught on our first day at sea were white sharks. Now, to me, that was absolutely mind blowing. I expected us to get things like ragged tooth sharks, bronze whalers, dusky sharks, hammerheads. Sure, we might get the odd white shark, but to get two in one day, to me, was, was absolutely unbelievable. We even caught some little uh, leopard sharks. And we caught a very wide diversity of sharks on that first trip, but unfortunately, no Zambezi sharks. And in retrospect, that may have been because the water was still a little bit cold. It was well below 20, but also we weren't using live bait. We subsequently discovered that the key to, to catching Zambezi sharks appears to be The idea was to catch sharks of the target species, particularly Zambezi's and also tiger sharks, um, and to a lesser extent white sharks, and to insert internal acoustic tags. And we then deployed uh, six listening stations or acoustic receivers, basically between Third Beach and Hagen Terrace, to try and get an idea of residency and movement patterns of those, of those sharks. Eventually, in, in March last year, we managed to catch two white shark, uh, two uh, Zambezi sharks, and we caught a third one in, in April. We've spent many days fishing for them this summer, but unfortunately have been without success. So we've got three Zambezi sharks swimming around the area with internal acoustic tags. Now, my assumption was based on catches of, of Zambezi sharks in the shark nets and divers' observations of Zambezi sharks at Protea Banks on the KZN south coast. But come May, the water temperature drops to the point where these sharks seem to disappear. We know they, they do still occur on the KZN coast. We get the odd one in the nets during the winter. But generally, the peak is, is in the summer months. And I expect, it, particularly given the fact that we were now working south of KZN in slightly cooler water off Port St. John's, that come winter, these uh, Zambezi sharks will leave the area and probably head up into the warmer waters of Mozambique. One of the males, we assume, did that. Um, we picked it up for a day or two after we tagged it. 
we haven't picked it up again. One of the, the, the other males um, <coughs> stuck around for a few days and then disappeared, reappeared on our acoustic receivers in July, in midwinter, just for a day or two and then disappeared. But one of the, the females, the largest of the sharks we tagged, um, just over three meters in terms of total length, she remained at Port St. John's for virtually the entire, well, in fact, for the entire winter. What I've showed you here is basically just the, the acoustic detections at four of our receivers um, from the end of, end of March um, up until the, end of, the beginning of August. And you can see that that particular female was there virtually the entire time. She seemed to spend most of her time off the lighthouse at the river mouth and then at Agateris, which is just north of the river. But she also made forays down to the south um, as far as this third beach. So this confounded all, all expectation. But unfortunately, the limitation is that these results are based on a, on a sample size of three. And clearly, we need to get a lot more tags into animals. We were fortunate that Chris Fisher donated us some more tags. So we've got a lot of tags waiting. We just need to catch the sharks to be able to put, uh, put the tags into them. We know that the, uh, we've known for a long time that the Amzan Bugle River is a very important nursery ground for Zambezi sharks. They're born at about 55 centimeters pre quarter length. And we were sure that this must have some sort of tie up with, uh, with the, the shark attack scenario. And we figured that it would be worthwhile um, trying to get a better understanding of what was happening in the Amzan Bugle River. We've called on Paul Carley, who's got a lot of experience in both estuaries in the Eastern Cape as well as um, acoustic tagging, and he came on board and provided us with some additional receivers and some, um, some tags that were surplus to his requirements. Unfortunately, those acoustic tags were very, very short-lived in terms of battery time. They, they had a lifespan of, of a couple of months. But anyway, we figured it would be a nice preliminary survey, and depending on the results, we could then put more long life tags into some of the smaller individuals in the river. To date we've tagged 13 animals, uh, ranging in length as you can see from 55 to uh, 100 centimeters, pre quarter length. And these are the locations of the temporary receivers that were in for about six months in the in the Amazon River. We haven't got around to analyzing any of the, of the data yet, but it appears that these young, these young uh, Zambezi sharks are very much estuarine dependent, at least for the first few years of their life. These are some of the questions we're hoping <coughs> that we'll be able to answer using this, uh, this technology. Do the animals leave the estuary? We have picked up one or two of the animals on our receivers out at sea, and it's it was on two occasions that that coincided with a flood, so we suspect that the animals um, may not voluntarily move out of the river in flood conditions, but in, they may be caught in a situation where they literally flush out the river. So the question is, when a flood comes down, what do the animals do? Do they go upstream or do they end up going out to sea? And a small 55 centimeter long Zambezi shark is probably not going to survive very long if it swims around um, out at sea. Large numbers of ragged tooth and other other sharks around, they're going to be easy easy prey for a lot of larger sharks. So I guess it would be wiser to stay in the river. How long do they remain in the river? We one of the animals we, we caught and tagged was 69 centimeters. That that was tagged earlier this year. It had been caught the previous summer at 57 centimeters. So we assume 57 centimeters was size of birth and that this animal had grown 12 centimeters in the ensuing year. The fact that we've had animals as large as a meter suggests that maybe these young Zambezi sharks might spend at least two, if not three years, um, living inside, inside the, the estuary. And obviously the other questions um, I've, I've already discussed, but there's certainly a lot that we can learn using telemetry on these young animals. 
What Paul Cowley has also done is introduce the OTN network, and I think Enrico, you're going to be talking about um, offshore network um, just north of the Zimbabwe River. So in addition to our listening stations and the temporary ones in the river, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to put some of those back um, in, in the near future, we're going to get a, a nice picture of the movement um, and residency patterns of not only the larger sharks, but also the, the smaller sharks and their use of the, uh, the estuary. But getting back to the question at hand, and that is the dilemma. Why, there been this, why has there been this sudden outbreak of shark attacks at Port St. John's, given the fact that it doesn't have a significant history of shark attack? In fact, the incident in 2005 was the first documented one for Port St. John's. And yet Port St. John's has been one of the top holiday resorts on the wild coast for decades. It's true that there are more people in this using the water now than they might have used 30 or 40 years ago. Um, but I think that's true to say of virtually the entire South African coast. We've got more and more people using the sea for, for recreation. So I don't think the answer simply lies there. Um, we know that the Yams and Bubu is an important nursery ground for young Zambezi sharks. Does this mean that more of the larger animals are frequenting the area? Some of them, the females, might obviously be there to give birth. Some of the larger animals might be possibly entering the estuary to feed on things like cob and grunter. But they've probably been doing that for, for hundreds, thousands of years. So why all of a sudden would, they, would there be a greater incidence of these animals in, in the last decade? And it may well have something to do with what has been happening in KZN, where we've seen a steady degradation of a lot of our estuaries, which might historically have been very important feeding and nursery grounds for Zambezi sharks. The fact that those, those estuaries have become so degraded and silted up has forced the Zambezi shark to move further south and to make use of the less disturbed estuaries uh, on the wild coast. The fact that St. Lucia has been, was closed for a decade has obviously compounded um, the problem. We know that there are lots of sharks in the area. In addition to those two white sharks I mentioned earlier, we've caught another four. We've picked up 15 of the O-Search tagged um, white sharks at Port St. John's. So it clearly is a very, very sharky area. And it is possible that, although we don't have evidence, that some of the, the victims of the attacks, particularly those where we never recovered the bodies, might have been uh, victims to white sharks. Looking at the bite marks of those bodies that we have been able to examine, there's no proof of white shark involvement, but it is possible that those in which the bodies were never recovered might well have been white sharks. Because the only record that I know that I can think of, contemporary record of a shark attack victim disappearing completely out of trace, was Tyna Webb at Fisher. She was undoubtedly taken by a white shark. So it is conceivable that it may be white shark involved. People have suggested, is it a rogue shark? That's, that's a difficult one to, um, to dispute. I would think, I certainly don't think it's a case of one shark that's now developed a taste for human flesh, as we had the situation with man-eating lions and tigers other environments. Um, but it's not inconceivable that it's a small number of sharks that are coming closer and closer inshore than normal and therefore coming into greater, having greater contact with, uh, with humans. The last two I think are probably red herrings. Um, the first one was suggested by a lot of the um, inhabitants of Port St. John's because I think they're desperate to get the municipality to <laughs> clean up the sewerage problem. <laughs> Animal sacrifices, when we first uh, were alerted to the, the, the shark attacks in 2009, uh, one, of the, one of the suggestions was because of animals being sacrificed on Second Beach and a lot of blood entering the water. We spoke to the local authority about it and they acknowledged that it was a problem, 
but they also agreed to try and divert the people who were doing this uh, to other areas and to warn them not to, to do it at Second Beach. And I think they've been reasonably successful in it, but the fact remains is that the attacks have continued. So I think the contribution from the blood of animal sacrifices is probably minimal in this, uh, in this situation. So what can be done about it? The locals desperately want shark meats. As far as they're concerned, it's not, a, it's not an issue. They're not concerned about the environmental uh, impact. They feel that they want shark nets. They look up the road and they say, KZN has got shark nets, therefore, why, why can't we be here? And I think you'll all appreciate that shark nets come at a huge financial cost because they're very labor intensive. You don't split them in the water and leave them. And there's obviously also the environmental cost, particularly given the, the large number of sharks which we've encountered in the area, not to mention the fact that bottlenose dolphins occur there. Uh, humpback dolphins are sighted there on a regular basis. I'm sure that there's quite a diverse ray fauna, and we know that in winter that area is, is full of uh, migrating humpback whales. So th that, is, that is a huge decision that has, has to be taken. Another suggestion would be um, selective removal of certain, certain animals. The question is, on the, the issue is on land, that's very easy, because problem animals can be easily identified and taken up. In the sea, that is going to be very, very difficult. For example, do we take out that female that's been resident there throughout the winter? But the fact that she's been there throughout the winter and most of the summer, maybe suggest she's not the culprit. So maybe if she was, then there'd be more shark incidents. So maybe it's these sharks that come in for a few days and then disappear. So, so while it, it sounds good in theory, it's probably going to be very difficult to implement in practice. People have suggested, what about spotters? Um, on good days, certainly possible, but with the proximity of the river and the prevailing winds which are onshore and the currents running north to south, the water is often uh, dirty at, at Second Beach. <coughs> Zambezi sharks, unlike white sharks, don't spend much time on the surface. In fact, they spend very, very little time on the surface. One option would be to ban bathing in the afternoon and in summer or when there's dirty water. It sounds simple in theory, but when people have driven all the way from the Tata uh, for a day at the beach, particularly in the heat of summer, and it takes them two hours to get there, they will have no sooner got there than they will be kicked out of the water because it's now afternoon. One thing that we felt was very important in that was to get warning signs put up there. They're, certain, they're unlikely to prevent shark attack, but at least warn people of the dangers. And fortunately, after two years, the municipality did in fact heed our, our recommendation. Improved lifeguard and emergency services. Initially, lifeguards were employed for a couple of months during the year, and that's dwindled due to the lack of, of uh, finances on the part of the municipality. And I think the lifeguards only work, they work for less than 30 days in the year. They don't have sophisticated emergency facilities. Um, again, that wouldn't prevent a shark attack, but it may well save a life if you can, if you can stop the bleeding and initiate first aid immediately. To me, one, one very favorable option would be to either look at a, at a tidal pool. In 2011, uh, although there was only one fatal shark attack, six people drowned. And just to give you an indication of how, how people's perspectives are warped when it comes to shark attack, the locals seem more worried about the, the few people that are getting killed by sharks than all the people who, who might be drowning uh, during the year. So a tidal pool or some sort of shark exclusion net, animal sacrifices, I think we've pretty much got that under, under control, and the sewage, I think, as I said earlier, is probably just a, a red herring. If we look at, uh, at Second Beach, there is a, an area which um, has potential for an exclusion net to the northern end. Um, this was taken on a very, very calm day, and as you can see, the water is relatively clean. And this little embayment here, 
It's about 50 meters wide across here. Unfortunately, there are a lot of rocks in the, in the area, so it would be a case of putting some sort of structure across this gap here and maybe dynamiting some of these rocks out to create a, a, larger, a larger swimming area. Um, again, an expensive undertaking, but if, if, you, if, you, if you're looking to provide anything, I think that this is probably one of the, one of the better options, um, certainly from an environmental point of view, that, that uh, one could consider. That's the sharp warning sign that it took them two years to, to put up, but at least it's there. And then finally, just to thank um, my co-workers on the project, Paul is here with us, Paul Carley and Rod Hastier who used to work with us at the Sharks Board who is now 